when I woke up from my surgery to, fin to fix my aneurysm, when my eyes opened, I thought everything seemed okay. First, I'm realizing I'm paralyzed. Next, I'm realizing it's difficult to breathe. And my life was a question mark for months. I was literally living one breath at a time. And I would say to myself, if I can just make it to the next breath, and that's how I lived for weeks. Live your life in every breath, but live to the next breath. And if I could do that, then I could conquer anything. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. My guest today was born in New Haven, Connecticut, grew up in Pomona Beach, Florida, and is now living in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife of 32 years, Marilyn. He's had a career in the U.S. Air Force flying strategic airlift a career in commercial aviation with three different worldwide cargo airlines flying and teaching, and is now an airline instructor with a commuter airline. His passions are traveling and, and adventuring worldwide, and his creative endeavors are beginning a new chapter in his life as a writer and becoming a motivational speaker. I am pleased to welcome Jeffrey Morse. Jeff, are you ready to share your story of hope? Absolutely, Tamara. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to your show. Oh, it's it's such an honor. So let me ask you, what interested you in flying to begin with? <laughs> um, well, when I was growing up in Connecticut, in New Haven, Connecticut, my father used to take me to the Tweed New Haven Airport, uh, myself and my brother. And we would go visit with a friend of my dad's who was a pilot and aircraft mechanic. And at five years of age, that's where the aviation bug bit me. <laughs> after moving to South Florida, um, growing up in Pompano and going down to the Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport or the Fort Lauderdale International Airport, we would just sit and watch planes take off and land for hours. And I would think to myself, you know, I wanna do that someday. So I made that my goal and made the goal happen. The aviation bug bit me early and here I am today. I'm still in the midst of it and thankful for every single day I've had in aviation. Oh, well, that just sounds so amazing and so fun. And, and it's so fascinating to me when people figure out what they want to be when they grow up when they're five. <laughs> <laughs> You know, oh my goodness, that that just blows my mind. But it took me a long time, even to the point when I was in college, to figure out what I wanted to major in. And then life, of course, takes its twists and turns. <laughs> sure, yes, yes, they do. <laughs> oh my goodness. So talking about twists and turns, let's talk about a few in your life. Okay. Life, life hasn't always been super easy. Why don't you talk to me a little bit about some losses in your family and also losses of friends within the military capacity and how, how you were able to work through that? Well, um, for starters, losses in family, uh, you know, of course, we all go through this throughout our lives. And uh, one of the things that I realized at an early age was that you don't get do-overs in life. So if you don't get do-overs, then be with your family when you get the, those opportunities, because you never know when some twist of fate isn't going to work in your manner. I was always big with being with my grandparents every opportunity I got, even when I was in the military and I had an opportunity to go home. Then later on in life, uh, in 2010, on Thanksgiving, while celebrating with my cousin Linda and her husband and um, most of the rest of the family, 
my father and um, his wife were down in South Florida celebrating. But I got a call from his wife on Thanksgiving telling me my father had stage four melanoma and I needed to tell the family what happened. Wow. And after Thanksgiving was over, uh, my wife and I said our goodbyes. I gave my cousin Linda a big hug and she told me, Jeffrey, I'm here for you with everything that's getting ready to happen. And I, I thanked her and I drove home. We um, flew down to Florida so we could be with my father who was just going into the hospital when I arrived. And I spent the rest of November and December uh, with my father as he slowly declined. And on December 23rd, he passed away. I was glad I got to be there with him during those last few weeks and share moments with him and be proud that I was his son and that I had a lifetime of experiences and, and learning from him. And yes, it was very difficult. I remember calling my cousin Linda, uh, standing on the beach, talking to her about everything that happened. And I managed to move through the next few days and then it was time to go home. And I got on the drive home. I spoke to Linda once more, uh, get home, get back into life, trying to get a grasp on the moment. And on January 1st, I decided to go scuba diving with some friends and had a problem with my ears. I needed to come back up. And when I got to the surface, Marilyn was standing there. And she never shows up where I scuba dive. And suddenly she's there. And as I'm getting out of the water, she said, I have bad news. And the first thing I thought was maybe it was her parents. But then she told me my cousin Linda passed away the night before on New Year's Eve. I hadn't even put the luggage away. And we were having to repack to drive to Tennessee to now go to her funeral. And I hadn't even buried my father yet. Mm. So trying to get a grip on that moment was very difficult. And the one thing I was thankful of through it was that I had taken the time every time I had an opportunity to spend with them. So I didn't have regret. And that was probably the most important thing in the world to me was that every time I had the opportunity to pick up a phone, write a letter, go visit in person, I did that. So yes, I was going to miss them dearly because they were two of the most important people in my family, but I knew they were gone now and I needed to figure out how to move forward, how to move on with my life. And the first six months of that were difficult, but I, I managed through. For the friends in the military um, that took their lives, um, one of the, one of the things I found in my teenage years, I had a friend that was hazed in high school. Um, we were on a soccer team together, and some of the other guys on the soccer team would haze him, judge him, uh, because he wasn't playing to their level. And that bothered me. And I spoke to the other guys regularly about leaving him alone. Mm -hmm. and sometime later, he um, he took his life and that bothered me for years that I couldn't do anything. And I had a hard time trying to figure out how to move through that. I had another high school friend years later take her life. And then when it happened with the friends in the military, that was when I started realizing that I couldn't always be there, but the one thing that I did learn of it was, and that I already knew, was don't ever assume when you're talking to somebody that everything's okay. When you're speaking to somebody, be kind and let them know that, yes, you are a friend, you are always there. So if something does go to that level, hopefully they'll reach out to you before they 
consider further going down that road. So there were a lot of life lessons in it with each person that I knew that did that. I miss them very much to this day. Um, but you do realize there's only so much you can do and you can't always be there. And that's probably the most disturbing part of it of all is that you may not sense what's going on within them, the conflict within them. All you can do is let them know you're always there and you're never judging. You accept them unconditionally, always. And if you can do that with every friendship, with every person that you know, to always be there unconditionally for them, hopefully they know in times of trouble that they can reach out to you. And you should consider it an honor that they did and help them be there for them. That's very important. That's a, that's a big takeaway. And it was a big takeaway for me as I proceeded into what happened to me years later with my aneurysm, my stroke and paralysis, those were things that carried me through, even in my darkest hours, that I knew that I had people there for me. And I was very grateful for that. So mm -hmm. I always tried to find something positive out of something negative. If there was anything that harmful, try to find your way through, but always try to be there for others. Mm. Wow, you have really pulled out some really important key points. And first, of course, is learning that to be kind, to spend time with people, to look for the good in hard times. Um, and, and those are hard to do, especially when you're grieving. Yes when you're so sad um, because of either the choices of others or perhaps the circumstances in your own life, what would you say to someone who is perhaps grieving right now and just is having a hard time finding positive things to look at in their life? The first thing I would say is take a leap of faith. God is there, your family is there, your friends are there. If the family component of that is questionable, then find somebody else to speak to. There are so many groups that have people that are going through exactly what you're going through. Reach out and try to find them. That's that leap of faith I'm talking about. Don't just think that there's no way out of the situation that you're in. You've got a big, beautiful world around you. If you can put one foot in front of the other, you're already a winner. Walk outside, go look up at the big blue sky and realize you do have a good life. You need change, yes. Find a way through that. Find a way forward through it. But take that opportunity yourself to do that and realize you are your own advocate here. And it may take you concentrating your energy on finding something good. And when you find it, embrace it, hold on to it. But don't just stop there. Keep trying to move yourself forward to find happiness again. And if the least thing you can do is walk into the bathroom and look at the mirror and smile again. Remember how you do that. You know, that's not lost. So start there. Make that your first step. Walk in and look at yourself in the mirror and just smile and realize that that's not broken. And if you can do that, if you can muster up the energy to do just that, then you have the energy to pull yourself out of whatever you're in. It's never going to be that bad. Mm. You know, I... I, I love what you shared there. I, it brought to mind just yesterday was talking to a loved one who was uh, in a moment just really, really struggling. And um, it's interesting when we're down that we seem to project that sorrow and grief and sadness, not only for that day, the pain, but we project it into the future with a view like it's never going to get better. 
you know, we talk in terms of absolutes, like it's never going to get better. It's always going to be this bad. And I remember um, turning to this family member and just saying, don't assume you know the future. I said, no, you don't have the strength to go through months and perhaps years of this struggle. But can you handle today? Can you handle the next five minutes? And so sometimes I think just taking that view and maybe not looking at tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, but just focusing on, okay, today, can I make it through today? And then taking those steps to do that, you know, because I think that's, that's often one of the biggest turning points is, is just mentally saying, okay, I'm not going to project the awfulness of today into the rest of my life, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting to hear you say what you just said right there with trying to get through each day. When I woke up from my surgery to fin- to fix my aneurysm, when my eyes opened, I thought everything seemed okay until I realized I couldn't feel my body. Mm-hmm. And it was difficult to breathe because first I'm realizing I'm paralyzed. Next, I'm realizing it's difficult to breathe. And my life was a question mark for months. It was certainly a question mark for the next few weeks. And I was literally living one breath at a time. And I would say to myself, if I can just make it to the next breath, and that's how I lived for weeks. If I can make it to the next breath, live your life in every breath, but live to the next breath. And if I could do that, then I could conquer anything. And when I thought, well, it can't get worse than this, that week when all this happened, it did get worse. Mm. It got a lot worse for me, but I wasn't going to let that in. And I found that if I could do that, live one breath at a time and move that to a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, then be happy for that. Allow that grace into your life and wrap your arms around it and be thankful for it. And anything else that happens in your life, and I'm talking about me when I say that, um, hey, it's not that bad. Um, That particular week while I lay on a bed in a hospital that I couldn't feel. And they moved me to the rehab center wing of the hospital. They moved me in with a gentleman who had diabetes, lost a leg uh, below the knee as a result of it, and had given up on life. Gave up on the doctors, gave up on the nurses, gave up on the therapy. And every night we would sit and talk two, three o'clock in the morning. I couldn't close my eyes because if I did, my body didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So I was relegated to being awake 24 hours a day. Well, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to talk to somebody and Mm -hmm. who better than the person in the bed next to me. And every day and every night I would talk to him to try to inspire him and tell him your life isn't over. Okay. You lost a leg below the knee, get a prosthetic leg, and get on with your life. Go live your life. Little did I know, the nurse's station was right outside of our door, and the nurses listened to me night after night, crying, listening to me, trying to encourage him. And why were they crying? Here's a man that's paralyzed from the neck down, trying to inspire somebody who lost a leg below the knee. While I was talking to him, I already accepted if my life ends five minutes from now, I'm okay with that. I've lived a good life. I have no regret. I'm thankful for every moment that I've had in my life. Now let me try to inspire somebody else. I wasn't thinking about the paralysis. I was thinking about trying to help somebody. Can I give something back to somebody else? Because I've lived a life of giving. And that always brought me to a better place, made my heart and my soul feel better. 
And all I wanted to do was try to help this man move on. I was just going to comment really quick that um, that that idea of giving and giving back, even when all you can do is breathe on your own, that is so inspiring. And, and I think that's another thing that helps us look out of ourselves is, is sometimes we get so consumed with our problems that we don't turn around and see the people around us. And I love the idea that you, even in your worst moment, you can lift another through your words or through your thoughts or through a text or through a smile or through however you can. But that is another way to help turn around the grief inside of you. Absolutely. You know, all right. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, 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 no. All I was going to say uh, to close that was he eventually lost his life because of giving up. And one of the things that I, I carry to this day is whenever I have a bad day, no matter what it is, I think back to those moments in that first week in that hospital. And I remember what I was faced with at that moment. And if I need a little energy to pull me through whatever I'm going through to this day, I think back to those moments and it reminds me to be thankful, to give grace, to acknowledge what you have and to be mindful of what's around you. Not only your surroundings, but the people in your life, the people that you do help. And if I had nothing else but to be paralyzed, I still had the ability to make somebody else feel good. And that was always important to me. Anytime somebody came to visit me in the hospital, if I could turn things around to get them laughing about something, to take the grief off of what they were staring at in me being paralyzed, if I could get them laughing, that was fuel for me. That made me feel good. It made me realize that, hey, I still have something to offer in my life. I can make somebody else happy while they're staring at what they're staring at in me and realize, hey, I may be down, but my life's not over. I still have a lot to offer, and I'm going to offer every bit of that that I can, every moment that I can. Mm. That is so impressive. Now, let's go back to that rehab center. You you were moved from, I'm sure, the ICU into rehab. And take me on that journey for you, what it looked like going from being completely paralyzed to where you are today and, and how you did that. <laughs> well, when I woke up from the surgery, realizing I was paralyzed, the first few moments of that are, oh my God, my life's over. What do I do now? How do I progress? Where's the instruction book here? Yeah. And I'm realizing, oh my God, there's there's no instruction book on this. And my, what are my first thoughts there? Well, you know what? Write the instruction book. Figure out whatever you're going to do over the next few years. Figure out how you're going to take notes on it keep those notes journaling, but write a book about it and write to people that are also going through this and figure out how to talk to everybody and say, hey, here's what I went through. Maybe some of this will help you while you're going through what you're going through. And in those first few moments, as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, well, all right, uh, I'll write a book. I'll figure out how to do that. I'll, I'll write a book about this. Uh, what do I want to call it? Well, how do I find my way forward out of this? Hey, there's an idea, finding forward. So those were the first few things on my mind. Then the doctor came in to say, well, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is you survived. The bad news is more than likely you're never going to walk again. And I just looked at him right in the eye and said, you know what? I'm down. I'm not out. I'm going to walk out of this hospital. And he patted me on the shoulder and uh, uh, nodded and he walked out. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to show you and I'm going to show you. <laughs> so, but going on from there, when they moved me into that rehab center and eventually took me down to the um, 
physical therapy gym for the first time. It was on a Saturday morning. Uh, the physical therapist wraps a belt around me. She pulls me up out of the wheelchair to make me stand. And I couldn't feel anything. I'm standing on something I can't feel. And in that moment, I thought, don't think the way you used to think. This is a leap of faith moment here. So run with it. Okay, you can't feel what you're standing on. But this lady just stood you up and you're standing on something. So let go of the fact that you can't feel it. Just let it go and stand there. So she let go and I'm standing. Wow. But I couldn't feel. So a few moments later, I'm uh, falling back into the chair. And I thought, well, you know what? If that can happen, other things can happen. So let's run with it. So as time went by, this thing of trying to make me move again was more me motivating everybody else in the physical therapy wing to say, look, I'm here to work. I'm not here to uh, talk about my grief, talk about what's going on here. I'm here to work. So when I'm here, I want 100% out of you because I'm going to give you 100%. Don't give me anything less. So when I come in this gym, you better be ready to work because I'm ready to work. You ask for 10 of something, I'm going to give you 20. So that was something they were, they were not used to. They were used to people giving up. And I wanted others in wheelchairs to see that I'm not down. If you're looking in my direction, I'm working hard and I'm going to make this thing happen. One of my therapists one day stood me up on a uh, walker as I was progressing and I said to her, what is it that I need to do to get out of the hospital to show you I can do what I need to do with this walker? And she said, well, one day you're going to need to be able to walk 50 feet unassisted with the walker. At that point, I could barely put one foot in front of the other, and I still couldn't feel anything from the neck down. I'm holding onto a walker with two hands that I can't feel. I'm standing on two legs that I can't feel. And I, I looked at her and I said, how far in front of me is 50 feet? And she looked out beyond me and she said, well, the front door of the gym. And I said, okay, fine, get out of my way. And I started doing that and I wasn't going to stop till I got my 50 feet. And then I went beyond that to the point that she finally grabbed the wheelchair from the assistant behind me and lashed it into the back of my legs to make it down. <laughs> And she would always say to me, why do you do this, Jeffrey? And I said, I would say to her, do you see those other people over there with the spinal cord injuries that are never going to walk again? I'm making these steps for them. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for others. That's what's important to me. That's what fuels me to move forward with this. I want my life back and I'm going to get my life back. Where is this going to go? I don't know. But I can't think about that right now. All I can think about is the present as I look forward. And if I can motivate somebody else to do something, then that's what I want to do. Those are the things that are important to me as I move forward. Everything was a question mark while I was in the hospital, right down to the point of, would I be alive tomorrow? I couldn't answer any of those questions. All I could do was give 100% and try to make other people laugh in the face of what they were looking at. So that's what I did. And on the day I made a promise to that doctor that I would walk out of that hospital. And on the day that I left the hospital, they wheeled me to the front door. I grabbed my walker and ugly that it was, I still walked. I got myself up out of that wheelchair and I walked out to that car. Mm -hmm. Yes, every step might have been ugly. They were the best steps of my life and I achieved that goal. So the other piece of this is setting goals. And that was what I did from the moment I woke up paralyzed. I just started setting goals. Ridiculous as they might be, I set them. I set them for years down the road. 
and I accomplished every one of them. And the, the one that's most important to me now is I wrote the book, yes, but here we are having a conversation, reaching out to people that need hope and inspiration. And, and that just warms my heart more than I can begin to tell you. Oh, well, you have such an inspirational story. And I love that in your mind, you just, you expected a hundred percent from others, but you also expected it of yourself and you were there to give a hundred percent. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, we'll have more lessons, tips, and things you can apply to your life. Stay tuned. Hey, my friends, are you looking for a meaningful Christmas gift this year? If so, you need look no further. I have a fantastic, sweet, short story. I am so excited to share with you my new booklet. It's called A Broken Down Holiday. This is the story of a widowed young mother trying to travel home for the holidays soon after her husband dies and being stranded in the middle of nowhere and some of the hard things that she experiences and some of the miracles that you wouldn't think were miracles that she had happen. But it is based on a true story that happened to my mother-in-law. It's great for those friends that you're just like, what do I get them? Something simple that's under five bucks. It's a great stocking stuffer. So if you want to share this message of hope with your friends or family members, check it out, A Broken Down Holiday on TamaraKAnderson.com. So I have to ask the question because my brain is just trying to process all of this. How in the world do you walk when you can't feel your feet? <laughs> well, one of the things that was interesting there was as that physical therapist was trying to get my brain to lock back into my body, as time was going on, although I couldn't feel uh, at my skin level, I couldn't feel pain, I couldn't feel hot or cold, I didn't feel like a human being anymore. I didn't uh, exist in that manner anymore as a typical normal human being. One thing that I did have, though, was I could sense things at the deep tissue level. and. Mm they could tap into that through vibration. So if they tapped on my leg, I could feel the vibration of that tapping, the pressure of it. And that was enough for me to lock into with my brain to talk to that part of the body to say, try to make that move. That took a lot of effort though. It, it began laying on my bed one evening um, trying to get a toe to move, trying to get my hand to roll over or a finger or fingers to move. Uh, little by little, I was able to tap into that. And it was so intense, it would cause headaches because I was concentrating on it so hard. But I realized if I could do that, even though I couldn't feel any of it, then I could tap into more. And it was just trying to figure out how do you get there? So talking with the physical therapists, I could relay that information and that was enough to get them to realize, oh, okay, hey, we know something we can do with that. So when they would get me standing, they would start tapping on my legs, for instance, uh, for instance, my arms. Um, but now walking, how do you achieve that? How do you achieve yeah move one leg, you know, put one leg in front of the other. And where does all that begin? Well, it begins in your glutes. So she would tap me on the rear end. And that was <laughs> enough to realize, hey, there's a vibration there and it's enough for me to lock into. And then if she tapped on my hamstrings or my calf muscles, then I could tap into that and she would pull the leg forward. One of the other things that they did along those lines was they actually attached a robot to me, to my body. Wow. And they had me suspended over a treadmill with this contraption attached to me. And when they turn it on, your legs are moving. 
Wow. So the robot is making you go through the movement and then they lower you down onto the treadmill while you watch an animated version of you on a television screen out in front of you and they tell you try to mimic that mm. so i got a number of sessions of that to try to help facilitate getting this picture in my mind again one thing i can say about paralysis is you know from the moment you you start crawling as a baby from the moment you take your first steps as a child tie your shoes put your clothes on all of those things are on a whiteboard if you will imagine you having a scribe in your brain your entire life and every time you do something new physically something's written and instructions written on that board throughout your life and then all of a sudden you have this event and you're paralyzed and your scribe not only isn't there anymore somebody's gone in and they've erased all of those instructions wow. from moving and now you've got to relearn how to write on that board again and make all that happen all over again in your life you're starting from zero from the moment you were an infant all over again and it may seem daunting but the one thing that you can say to yourself as you ponder all this is, I'm alive. I survived. God had a reason for keeping me around. There must have been a big reason to keep me alive through all of this. And I'm not going to let him down. I'm not going to let myself down. I'm not going to let my family or my friends down. I'm going to find my way through this thing and make this stuff work. This is your job now. That was my job. My other job no longer existed. Mm. What was my job 24 hours a day now? Figure out how to get my life back. Figure out how to move. Those were the things that motivated me through this, was mm. not to think about the negative or the fact that something didn't move. Okay, it doesn't move. Now figure out how to make it move. Six months later, I'm in Paris with my niece and nephew and my family and they wanted to go to the notre dame cathedral to go climb to the top and i oh said my. i said great let's go do it let's go do the spiral staircase i've done it before i've got familiarity with it i know what's involved with that so yeah let's go do that let's make that happen so we started climbing and halfway into it they're getting a little winded well i can't feel fatigue all I know is go. So <laughs> I climbed to the top. We're enjoying ourselves up there. And when it was time to go down, when I got over to the spiral staircase, oh no, the handrail is on the wrong side. Oh no. So it's on the right side instead of my left. And I couldn't feel my left hand. So now I'm staring at the stairwell, the spiral staircase, trying to figure out how am I going to go down? And I just thought, well, Turn around and go down backwards. Wow. So I did the spiral staircase backwards. Was I going to let this turn into a negative moment and be fearful of going down a spiral staircase 300 something feet? Or could I turn it into something positive? So I did. Uh, my niece laughed at me and she said, you know, Uncle Jeff, you walk too slow. I'll see you at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> my nephew Ryan stayed with me and we laughed all the way down. So those were the things that were important to me through this was, you know, yes, find the positive. But if there's ever a chance you get to be an example, be the example. And if you can make fun of yourself along the way for others to laugh, isn't that great that you can do that, that you can offer that one thing? There's your superpower right there. So oh, if you yeah. do anything else, give back. Find a way to do that. I love that superpower of laughter and humor. There is so much to be said for that. Um, two of my sons were diagnosed with autism. My My husband has always had a fantastic sense of humor. And he has really helped me because I tend to be the more serious of the two of us. <laughs> he has helped me to remember to laugh 
laugh through the hard times, laugh, you know, we'll cry and sometimes laugh in the same breath, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. but, but there is power in laughter and, and I'm thankful for that. The other thing I wanted to pull out of your story that just really struck me as you were telling it was the idea that even walking, breaking it down. Okay. First move your glute, then your hamstring, you know, that sometimes when we're trying to get out of a situation that's difficult or move forward, finding forward as your book, it's title says you have to break it down into such minuscule steps, but there's still steps, right? Yes. yes. So, Sometimes, yeah, it's going to be different. We're not going to be able to do the things that we used to do because of an aneurysm or a stroke or cancer or whatever it is. Life will look different, but you can still figure out, even in minuscule amounts, the steps to help move you forward. Yes. Yeah, you can. And you know, along those lines in saying that in in the beginning for me, I was breaking it down a little further to myself and saying, you know, it seems as I'm getting into this that there's two components, the physical component, the psychological component. And right now it's 80% physical and 20% psychological. And it seemed in the beginning that, hey, it's going to be like that throughout. And the further I got into it, as time went on, that's when I started realizing it's actually the opposite. It's 80% psychological and 20% physical. And the psychological component isn't just um, depression, those kinds of things, uh, how you're getting through each day, the pain, what kinds of conversations am I going to have? It's finding out that there still is a world around you. There's still trees out there. Birds are still singing. You can smell flowers in the spring. You can look up at a beautiful sky in the morning, a sunset, a sunrise. Those things are still going on around you, but you're so ingrained and um, pulled into this thing that you're doing all the time that you're forgetting all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And that stuff's important too. Why are you doing all this hard work? Why am I doing this every single day? I'm beating on myself to find my way back through everything. And I was forgetting that one crucial thing that life was going on around me, that I needed to stop and observe that and be mindful of it and thankful because that's ultimately why I'm fighting is to be able to recognize those things again. And it's so easy in a trauma to forget about it, to not even realize those things exist, that they're there. Isn't it great that maybe you can go out and sit in your backyard and just lay down in the grass and look up, just breathe and listen. Take all the monkey chatter in your brain and just shelve it for a little while and just look at what's going on around you. That's the stuff that's important too. And say, thank you, God, for giving me my life and for letting me continue. I don't know why you you chose me for this path, for this journey, but I'm thankful for it. And I acknowledge it every day. And when you choose to speak to me to let me know why I'm here, I'm willing to listen, to open up, to be objective to let you in and embrace what you're telling me so I can go forward and give that message out or do whatever it is that you need me to do. Those things are important. Mm. That gratitude is such an important component, isn't it? It, it really is. It really is. And, and I love how you reminded us to when we're grieving or when we're going through a hard time, pause. It's almost like you have to, if we had a remote control, <laughs> just <laughs> pause those emotions for a moment, go outside, take a breath of fresh air 
and just observe the world around you. Look at the sky, like you said, look at the trees, find little things to be thankful for. Maybe that you can see, um, or if you can't see, maybe you can hear um, and, and find things to be thankful for, time to connect with God. Um, you have a favorite Bible verse that you wanted to share, and I think it's very applicable as we're talking about this. Would you mind sharing that really quick? Uh, Psalm 4610, be still and know. That's what drives us to realize God is still there. It's important to know that. Um, my physical therapist taught me that, um, told me one day when she was working with me that I needed to stop and think about these things. And, and at one point she said to me, you need to tell yourself you're okay. And four years into it, I hadn't stopped to think about that. I thought about so many things along the way, but nobody ever said that to me. And that was a real defining moment for me to stop and say that. She said, say that, say those words to yourself, that you're okay. You survived this. You made it through. There's a reason you made it through. And up to that point, I hadn't really thought about it. I thought about the struggle the entire way, but this was when I was really starting to discover that I needed to sit and observe more and to let more life in because I was beating on myself so hard physically to try to get my life back. And although I may have observed some of this here and there, and I was taking the time to give myself that time back to lay down in the backyard and look up, I wasn't doing it enough. And thanks to her, she got me thinking about it even more. And when I started doing that, that's when I started calming down more, letting patience in, letting mindfulness back into my life again. And I was able to move on much better uh, from that point on. Um, and then six months later, after she told me that in um, June of 2016, in the end of November 2016, I decided to take a trip to Nepal for two weeks oh on my own. My. So just to get away from it all. Why was I doing all this hard work? What was all that supposed to be for if I can't go enjoy my life? And I need to do this on my own. And I need to go someplace I've never been, get off the grid and go plan a bunch of insane things for myself to do. And I did that. And I told myself with these adrenaline junkie things that I set myself up to do, you know what, if you can do it, great. And if you can't do it, that's great too, because at least you tried. Tell me some of the things you did. I'm dying to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I... I set something up called parahawking. So if you look at the front cover of my book, that's a picture of that day where I went off the top of a 6,000 foot mountain paragliding and feeding an Egyptian vulture in flight. And oh. um, so I did that uh, in the morning. In the afternoon, I after I finished that, um, hopped on a bus, went back up to the top of the same mountain to go zip lining for the first time in my life at 90 miles an hour. I took a um, uh, paragliding flight up into the Himalayan mountains um, with it. Oh, I think it was uh, 10 degrees below zero that day. We did that. Um, when I got back to Kathmandu, I chartered a helicopter to take me to Mount Everest. And wow. that was the highlight of my trip. We landed at a plateau at 18,500 feet. I got out of the helicopter and there were a few things that I needed to do that I did. It was personal to me. Um, I talked about it in the book. Um, that was the highlight of me going there. And I accomplished that too. 
And, you know, part of it was to tell the doctors who told me I was never going to walk again. Um, hey, guys, um, here I am facing Mount Everest. And um, I, I made that happen, too went over to the Mount Everest hotel at 13,000 feet to have champagne breakfast and share a bottle of champagne with a bunch of perfect strangers. <laughs> uh, a Japanese lady asked me uh, when I asked, Hey, would you like to celebrate with a glass of champagne? And she said, sure. What are we celebrating? And I said, life. And she said, great. I'm all in. So we hoisted our glasses towards the Himalayan mountains and had a nice glass of champagne uh, so it was fun doing that. So let me ask you, where are you right now with your paralysis? Can you feel any better than you used to? Yes, I do. Um, I've gone through uh, so many different types of therapy. I took all that on on my own from the time I got out of the hospital. I was going to try everything that I could from uh, yoga to Pilates to working in the gym to Tai Chi, you name it. Tried everything that I could. Um, Pilates, uh, I can't say enough about what Pilates does for somebody in my condition. Uh, working the small stability muscles, can't say enough about it. And I would tell anybody out there if you're looking for something to help you, go chase that down. The other two things that I would suggest that have helped me, and the one at the very top of that is neuromuscular massage therapy. Mm. And the reason I say that, this holistic therapy um, ha has been by far the biggest thing that's helped me. When you go through one of these things, it sets your uh, your sympathetic nervous system on fire, um, your, your sense of fight or flight. And when that goes into um, afterburner, it starts producing fascia um, inside of you. You already have fascia in you. It, it's kind of like a, a membrane spider webbing that holds all your muscles and your organs in place. Well, when something like this happens, the fascia production goes into overdrive. And when it's doing that, it's choking off the circulation to your nerves, your nerve. Mm. And you start to notice you feel like you're on fire uh, because of all the burning sensation from your nerves being choked off. The neuromuscular massage therapy over time has been breaking all that down to allow that circulation to manifest itself again. And when those nerve endings are suddenly able to start working again and telling muscles what they need to do, I'm noticing that I'm able to move more, move more effectively. Stability muscles are working again. Do I still have limitations? Yes, I do. But can I take myself out on a mile walk unassisted? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I can do that. Can I stand in a classroom and teach for eight hours? Yeah, I can do that too. Can I go to the grocery store? Can I put gas in my car? Yes, I can do all that. Can I hold a bag of groceries with two hands? Yes, can do that too. So can I feel 100%? No, I can't do that. But each day I get better. Each day I move better. My stability is better my gait is improving as I put one foot in front of the other. I can walk on unprepared surfaces now without falling. Do I have to watch my steps? Sure. But do I need to concentrate on it like I used to? No. Can I look forward when I'm walking instead of looking down at my feet to make sure one foot is going in front of the other? I don't need to do any of that anymore. So the holistic therapy that I found along my journey has helped me leaps and bounds beyond me chasing another course. Not to say those other courses are bad, they're not, but I found this has helped me 150% and I can't say enough about it. One of the other things that helps with that fascia is something called dry needling. And when I have that done, it um, 
it pulls that fascia towards the needle and it gets rid of the fascia. But am I better? I'm a thousand times better than where I was laying in bed paralyzed. So um, can I function on my own? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yes, I, you know, I have to move a little slower. Uh, I wish I could run again, but I'm happy that I can put one foot in front of the other and do every other thing that I can do right now. I have to do things a little differently and that's all okay. Perfectly okay. Wow. I love that you talk about um, your progress, that it's, that you've come miles and miles and miles where you've been, but it's just been by these teeny tiny itty bitty steps. And yes. to not put a limit on your, your ability to make progress. Because I think too often, like you said, sometimes it's psychological, you know, in my brain, I, I won't be able to do that. Well, you're right. If you, if you think you can't, you can't. But I love how you just have opened yourself up to saying, let's see, let's try. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Your doctor would just be blown away <laughs> to see how far you've come, you know, so don't, don't put limits on your body's ability to heal. The body is amazing and can heal and God designed be that way. You know, it's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. It, you know, one of the things I said in the beginning is don't let, I can't into my vocabulary. I don't want to let, I can't into my world. And the other thing that I said to myself, and I've said for many years is do things because you want to, not because you have to. Oh my goodness, Jeff, this has been so fun. So there are going to be people out there that are like, I want to go buy Jeff's new book. <laughs> <laughs> so you can hear all the, the, the other details that he hasn't been able to share in this short interview. Tell us where we can find your book, Finding Forward. So it's available now on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Walgreens, and Target. I hope everybody uh, who needs it and needs a different perspective, yes, uh, please read it. Uh, I wrote it for so many reasons. One, to say thank you for everybody who helped me get there and to acknowledge them, but also to reach out to everybody who needs to find that instruction book, that some other means of getting to where you want to be and live your life, enjoy the journey and be happy, smile. Uh, Every day is a gift. Be thankful for that. That's what's most important. Absolutely. Now, where can we contact you and find you on social media? We'd love to know that as well, because there will be people will be like, I need to connect with Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I want to follow first, him. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I would say is please do. If you want to reach out, please do. I can be reached on my website, which is Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, Middle initial A, Morse, it's all one word, no dots in between. Uh, so jeffreyamorse.com. You can reach me on Facebook, uh, Jeffrey A. Morse, or finding underscore forward. Um, you can find me there on Facebook or uh, Instagram or Twitter. Uh, and it would be a pleasure uh, and an honor to meet anybody that wants to reach out and speak. Um, I'm always looking forward to talking to people and um, hearing their story. That's important to me too. Well, it, it, it is good to hear other people's stories. We learn so much from the stories that we listen to. Yes. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, subscribe so you can get your weekly dose of powerful stories of hope. I know there are many of you out there who are going through a hard time, and I hope you found useful things that you can apply to your own life in today's podcast. If you would like to access the show notes of today's show, please visit my website, storiesofhopepodcast.com. There you will find a summary of today's show, the transcript, and one of my favorite takeaways. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this episode with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a quote or a scripture verse that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this podcast. 
May God bless you, especially if you are struggling, with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and he will help you bear the burden. And above all else, remember God loves you.